All right. So, all First, right, I really apologize knowing that we were doing a talk with the Navy. I tried to do some <laughs> uh, late night research. Hey, it's all good, hurt. man. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, if you want to go ahead and text Chris, see if he's going to join us, uh, Chris Danbach. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, I'm going to go ahead and get us started here, Nick, with you. And then if uh, Chris, you know, we're all business running businesses. So it's very sure is probably unavoidably detained as all the chiefs would say. Um, but dude, Nick, thank you for your time, brother. I nah, appreciate it. Happy to be here. I love what you guys are doing. I think it's, you know, awesome for everybody that's tuning in, you know, trying to be productive during this downtime. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, look, let me, let me give everybody here listening in a little background about Nick Ripplinger. The, uh, the owner and proprietor of uh, Battlesite Technologies, uh, also well known for the Ripplinger effect. <laughs> uh. the, the great thing about Nick is, is he has taken a vision, and this is where the, the whole theme here of being a uh, innovation, you know, leadership through innovation. And Nick literally took an idea, and I'm not going to steal too much of his thunder here, but literally walked into a patent office, bought a patent, and fast forward a couple of years later, his company has now been awarded like over, you know, tens of millions of dollars in contracts and even generating his own patents and still serving, served in the army, still serving our, our fighting force today through the civilian sector. Nick, thanks so much for joining us, brother. I can't, I can't thank you enough, my man. Oh man, happy to be here. So, of course, Nick, i got to kick things off with, uh, if you've watched any of my, my segments here, I always got to kick off with an interesting question. Is that okay? Yeah, man. Open book right. here today. All right. So, when you're in your car alone, all right, what do you think about? Oh, man, I think it depends on the day, you know, or even the time of the day. You know, I live about 25 minutes from our shop, so it's all pregame on the way into the office. Right. Uh, a couple, you know, errands running around during the day. It's always hectic. So I'm thinking about what's next. And then on the way home, it's usually, you know, how can I make my kids laugh? Right. You know, I spent, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours away from them that day. You know, what can I do when I get home to, you know, be present in that moment? That's awesome, man. Well, you know, Nick, you've, you've really created something special. So I guess let's go ahead and take a couple of minutes and explain to everybody what your company does and uh, and what we've been, what you've been involved with so far since being out of the military, maybe a little background about you in the military and then what you're doing in a comp with the company now still serving. Yeah. So don't throw uh, any tomatoes or anything, but I was a CID guy in my last job running the protective service detail for the NATO commander. Didn't arrest anybody. So you guys are all safe, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I had this great opportunity to work, uh, with Admiral staff Redis back when he was the NATO commander. So a little shout out to you Navy guys, but, uh, and kind of, you know, you're talking about living their life in thirds earlier. So that was kind of like my first real experience with, you know, super senior, you know, military leadership. We were dealing with heads of states and everything like that. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, unfortunately, an old injury that happened in Iraq back in 2009 caught up with me in 2011. Mm -hmm. And I was medically retired. And, you know, much like everything else, right? You have this beautiful plan that goes to shit 10 minutes afterwards. So, you know, my wife and I were pretty financially smart while we were in the military. We had some money saved up. I was going to take a year off, go back to school and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, we were home for about three weeks when she told me she was pregnant. Oh, wow. I didn't have any kids at that time. I had no clue. All I know is that kids are expensive. So I went back to work, uh, started off as a government employee, hated every minute of that. Um, that lasted about six months. Uh, went out to private industry in the defense space. Um, kind of got sucked in this weird mergers and acquisition space. Sold the first company I was with uh, to private equity. Then went to uh, ATK when they did the big uh, orbital merger. And then went to the last company. It was in the process of selling to private equity. Helped a little bit with that. And then I was just completely burnt out. You know, it's you know, I live in Dayton, Ohio, so really the next step in the defense world was to go to one of the coast. My wife was like, cool, have fun. Like, send us letters. We're not moving with you. <laughs> um, so that's really like the 2017 time frame when Battlesite came to be. Um, and one of our mentors, or my, one of my mentors, 
was like, hey, there's this really cool technology that the Air Force has and they're trying to sell it or license it or I don't remember the exact wording. But anyway, the Air Force is trying to unload this to somebody who go out and manufacture it. Um, and kind of the funny story is, is we passed on it the first time. Really? So, yeah. So, you know, it turned into be, you know, a multimillion dollar business we passed on. Um, so the second time that same opportunity presented itself, depending on who tells the story, you know, I got excited and, you know, we jumped in and we called up the air force and we're like, Hey, we don't know, you know, what your process is or how you guys are doing this, but we want to buy this patent and we want to turn it into a product line and, you know, form a company around it. So we went through that process. It was awesome. Uh, kind of rewrote the way the air force does tech transfer during that time. We, you know, then stood up manufacturing. We made every mistake along the way. turns out we're not very good manufacturers. We're not really good uh, researchers and developers, but kind of like you said, we just kept moving forward. And, you know, one of the sayings that we say, you know, at every staff meeting is, you know, how are we going to violently execute today? And that means one thing in the military, you know, being an old army guy, it's, you know, how are we going to go kill the enemy? Right. But it's no different than in the business world is, you know, what are we going to go violently execute on today to make progress and move the needle and advance this company, you know, for the, the whole team that's here. Well, I, I think that was awesome. Like, so I want to backtrack about this and make this clear about this. So I, I think Nick is, of course, a humble uh, leader in himself, but I want to put this perspective. So you walk into the, basically the Air Force patent office, buy a product. I think you paid, I think you said like 10 grand for it, right? Yeah, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it wasn't anything crazy. But it wasn't a crazy amount. And then you, no. so you just it paid, took somebody else's idea, you bought it from them, and then you just took it to market. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and literally landed like, you know, something like a 10 or $12 million contract out the box. Yeah. So, so I mean, dude, that, that right there is just innovation in its own right. And I think uh, I'm a huge proponent of, uh, of veteran entrepreneurship. You know, we've talked quite a bit offline. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm kind of excited about what you've done building and leading this company through innovation. Like tell the, I got to hear you tell the story about like with you and Bennett when you first got it and you're just trying to like figure things out, like the whole oh, man. thing. Yeah. So our product, the Craytac, it's an infrared writing crayon. So you can color on anything with uh, this crayon. It's invisible to the naked eye, but it looks like a chem light through night vision goggles. So super cool. But so you, bought, out, you bought a patent for a crayon. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. An invisible crayon. An invisible, yeah. It's like total spy shit. <laughs> but uh, so in patents, it's super weird. They don't tell you, hey, you do A, B, and C, and then you have the product at the end. It's written in such generic terms so that you don't get knocked off, but you still have the protections. It's kind of a goofy world. But uh, turns out, you know, myself and the other two partners, neither one of us are chemists. We don't have a chemist on staff. At this time, we were, you know, super poor. We were all dumping in personal money. And it was just kind of, you know, starting to run low. And it really is, you know, is the company going to survive was a big question. Right. It, it was an unknown, um, very much like in today's climate with all the unknowns. But, uh, you know, there is, you know, nights that we've slept at the shop. And it's, you know, we like to, you know, we, we talk about failing fast, right? If you have an idea, go experiment. Find out, does it work? If it works, great. You know, we learned something. If it doesn't work and it's a total failure like who give like who cares like now we know that doesn't work we can cross it off the list we will not spend any more time thinking about it which allows us to go and focus on that next step right and so i think that's kind of you know when i first saw the topic come out of leadership through innovation or i think that's what you're calling it but uh you know, we innovated every step of the way, not necessarily in the traditional sense. We're not coming up with the next greatest, you know, whiz bang, you know, throughout all of this, but every little step is a slight innovation to the solution. And I think, you know, I think that military background kind of gave us that intestinal fortitude to, you know, accept that failure and move on and do it fast. Yeah. Well, Nick, I, if I remember you, like you guys literally were like a chemist, like having like a chemistry set, like two prior military guys sitting there with beakers and stuff like mixing chemicals right yeah we still do that every day <laughs> yeah there's i don't know if you can see it behind me but uh that's a hand sanitizer station that we're you know setting up right just utilizing 
our skills and our assets to help us out or help out our community right now. So that's, that's pretty awesome in its own right, bro, that, that you guys have stepped up to the plate to support this, you know, crazy world that we're in right now. And because we all know there's a shortage of sanitizer going on around, uh, around the country. So dude, thanks a lot for, I mean, that's a great uh, example of American ingenuity, uh, very reminiscent of World War II days, which is the last time we've really experienced this type of um, crazy change in our world, right? And you guys literally were making IR crayons and then just shifted gears and you're now making hand sanitizer. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's, we did it for two reasons. Like, and I'll just get the selfish one out of the way. Is it was a way for us to generate some cash to keep our guys on the payroll. I didn't want to lay off our guys and have to go back and rehire. Hopefully we get the same guys. But if not, like all the training costs, it becomes like a huge economic impact to the company. But also it's, you know, that goodwill. We sold about half of what we manufactured and then we donated the other half to first responders. Who's, you know, a key, you know, customer base for us, mm -hmm. but no, it's been, it's definitely been an interesting way to kind of try to survive this pandemic. Well, I think that's exactly what, if you want to talk about the topic of uh, leadership uh, through innovation is the fact that you've been in the trenches the entire time from the beginning, you know, yeah. Some some leaders, if you will, will just have the great idea and they'll just hire people and, and roll with it. But you've been in the trenches the entire time, like learning every level as you grow, right? Yeah. And I, you know what? I wouldn't change that. Uh, like looking back, you know, talking about that quote from Jobs about connecting the dots, you know, we could have hired some people and, you know, we have a shortage of people right now that we're looking to hire for. But you know, I wouldn't change that at all. Like, I love the fact that I can go out there and make our product if need be. Mm -hmm. I know, like, where the dumpster is if the trash is taken out. You know, it's, you know, I, you don't just hang up that CEO title or whatever you want to call it and sit in an office all day looking at spreadsheets, although we do a decent amount of that as well. But I think it's so critical to be a, a leader, whether in the military or outside of the military, that you still keep those, you know, tactical skills honed so that you right. can go step in there when there's, you know, something wrong with the machine or, you know, somebody calls in sick, like you can't let those things slow you down in the business world. The same way we don't let it slow us down in the military. You just step up and get the mission done. I think that's awesome, man. So if that's the case, if I were to, so how do you, under these crazy times, how do you motivate your team to keep their eye on the ball during these crazy changes and when you're always trying to innovate to make things going, how do you keep them motivated? Oh, that's a great question. And one I don't think I have a great answer for, but uh, you know, we, we kind of furloughed, we're still paying all of our staff, but a lot of them are at home right now um, due to their own personal reasons and mm -hmm. everything that's going on. It's like, Hey, as long as our doors are open, we'll keep you guys employed. Don't worry about that. So a few of them went off and did that. Um, we also pulled in some additional help during this time. We've got uh, of age children working in here. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's hard. I think the real test of motivation when things get back to normal and, you know, how do you go from this downtime to ramping back up and, you know, adding value every day? I, and that's and I think that's a critical critical aspect of it. So it looks like we have our other partner in crime, Chris, joining us right now. Um, so What's up, guys, can you hear me, Chris? I sure can. How are you? What's up, brother? You want to? You got to turn your camera on there. Yeah. So the camera's on. The camera's uh, on. I, uh, I just need to kick you up to the panelist here. Yeah. Give it a second. Sometimes it is not wanting to work with me. There we go. We should be having you pop in here in just a second. Try it now. All right. How are you all right. Mr. Man, you Chris. look awful fancy, Chris. Oh, man. I had to put my nice clothes on. Don't have anything, <laughs> but I was tired of wearing the pajama pants, you know? <laughs> I love well, it. That's a great lesson in its own right, right? And during, during this quote-unquote lockdown, getting that routine where you have to get up and force yourself to get dressed when you, even though you don't have to. So despite popular belief, look, I even put jeans on for everybody. So I, I normally I just, you know, wearing my underwear under here, but today I actually dressed up for everybody. So, <laughs> so, um, all right. So Nick, first off, you know, me, you and Chris, we've spilt blood in the same mud in the business world uh, through the same programs, right? Yep. 
So uh, I want to do a little introduction on Chris as well. So uh, people understand why I felt these guys would be a, a, a great couple of guys to get talking. Chris, I know you've been tied up, man. So uh, we have about uh, 12 minutes to uh, kick things off. But Chris is a true entrepreneur in his own right. Uh, literally had uh, got out of the, what was the service you were in? I know Marine Corps. The Marine Corps. That's right. So, the, the, you know, us Navy will happily give you a ride anywhere you got to go, right? <laughs> so, um, so Chris sit there and started a business basically, uh, you know, as a landscaping company, right? Just, you know, mowing lawns and doing things like that. And then realized, and we got, we all have been influenced by the IVMF program that I mentioned yesterday, Institute for Veterans and Military Families through the EBV program, which is our Entrepreneur's Bootcamp for Veterans. And we've all been mentored and focused and, and, and had that same area. And with that, he's had the vision now to take that concepts that he learned through these programs. And brother, I want to give, I want to give you a big round of applause. Just landed a, what, $24 million contract to build a national cemetery for our veterans in New York, brother. Is that right? Yeah, me and Al Urban, another EBV grad, partnered up, went after it. We took it down. We're actually, we're building our final resting place, which is kind of cool. Brother, look, that goes to show you guys, for both of you guys, and this is where the, the I love the idea of the innov uh, leadership through innovation for both of you, because you both taken ideas, innovated them to make them better, and both of you, just like with my business, with regards to, you know, uh, you know I, we're building the first national military central real estate company with Central Residential. Even though we've served, we're still drawn to serving. And I think that's what we all have in common. You know, Nick, you're still serving by, you know, providing the warfighter with, you know, innovative technology. Chris, you literally took a landscaping business and now serving our, our fallen and are laying to rest our veterans, dude. I think that's amazing what we do. So, Chris, tell me a little bit more about your journey from getting us a little bit about your military and about what got you here today and your current business model. So, I uh, went into the Marines, infantrymen, 2007, uh, Iraq, 2009 to 2010. Got out on paper, it's like 2011, 2012, but really the end of my military service was uh, the end of 2010. That's when I started my lawn care business. I'd saved about $5,000 from Iraq, uh, my Iraq savings that I used to start my company up. Um, and for those of you that don't know the story, I went to Kinko's Copy. I made some flyers, sprinkled them around my neighborhood. I had 30 residential clients overnight. Uh, a year later, I started bidding on federal government contracts, and I won my first one, which was actually my reserve unit. I think it was uh, it was like four thousand dollars, and you know you would have thought I, I won the jackpot. Um, I thought it, you know I I did it, I made it. All our problems are solved, honey. To my wife, <laughs> um, and we were newlyweds at that time, and. Um, and so I kept learning about these federal government contracts. What I liked about them was the profit margin was a little bit higher than the commercial and residential uh, market, and they paid on time. I didn't have to go chase my money. They always paid on time. So I really started focusing on the government contracts and went after uh, lawn care jobs. And then we you know, kept bidding, bidding, winning contracts. Uh, 2012, I think, to beginning of 2012, we won the Long Island National Cemetery, which was a string trimming contract to string wow. trim all the headstones and curb lines. That was three and a half million dollar contract over five years. That really changed the face of the company because I was able to take that profit, reinvest it back into the company, and then really start to grow and team up on other opportunities with larger contractors. So that's how we've grown over the years. We've grown by teaming with companies that are larger than us that didn't have the service disabled vet certification. Um, we just put in a $15 million bid in San Antonio um, for managing a bunch of federal GSA buildings. Wow. So uh, at one time we're mowing the lawn on the outside of the building. Now we're transitioning to go ahead and start managing the buildings, um, which is an entire different industry we're getting into. But again, I, I was, um, introduced to a teaming partner through a friend and he said you know what? i think you guys would work well together and i said huh facility support services it's a different nix code than we have with landscaping i said let me go ahead and look into this a little bit and it really interested me because 
sometimes when you're working outside and there's a drought, you're not mowing the lawn, right? And right. you don't get paid if you don't mow the lawn. And in the winter, you're not mowing lawns. So a lot of these facility support service contracts uh, really entice me because it's, it's handling all the subcontractors that are associated with that building. So the janitorial, the window washer, lawn care, snowplow guy, elevator, HVAC. It's always generating money, which is good. Um, it's more stable for us. It's a more stable model for us. So even in the winter, we're going to be generating revenue. So that's what we're doing now. We've grown, uh, you know, so much, so much over the years. We're very, very lucky. Um, so I know that was a long-winded answer. But that, that's where we're at now, you know. Well, what I do like, and this is one thing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but you are in the process of writing a book about uh, uh, building a business with uh, basically bootstrap, right? It's bootstrapping means that you basically start a, start a business from next to nothing. And Nick, you have had the same experience, right? So yeah, no, we, we had the opportunity to take on some venture and some investors, and we decided this wasn't the right fit, so... Very similar bootstrapping yeah. story to Chris. So it's for everybody who's not in the business world, I mean, this is where I'm a big believer in, in merging civilian leadership and innovation with military innovation. And that is, you don't necessarily need a lot to, with, an, with an idea. You just need to take action on it. So that being said, Nick, let me ask you this. When it came to making that decision to move forward. And you, you made that comment of taking uh, violent action, right? And I think we both know our favorite uh, quote from General Patton, right? A good plan violent executed today is better than the perfect plan executed next week. So when, when was the time that you just, because you said you passed it up before, what was it that clicked in your brain and to, that you had to take that action? Yeah, you know, I think it's the one thing that we like really pride ourselves on is having the voice of customer. Um, you know, from our military background, our whole staff somehow militarily affiliated. But knowing that I would have been a customer for this product in my time in Iraq and Afghanistan, why wouldn't, like somebody's got to do it, why not me kind of situation. So let's talk about that because that now I, I, would, I do want to get the word about your innovation next too is your next thing. That, are you allowed to talk about the next thing you're about ready to release? I'm not sure what you're talking about, but probably. <laughs> So we have a lot of Navy folks out on, on yeah. here, right? Yeah. And a lot of Navy leaders. And you've taken that technology and now with your team, leading your team through innovation, you've now come up with your very first own patent. Can you tell us what that's about and how the Navy would give a crap? Yeah, so we took that same core chemistry that we spent two years trying to figure out not being chemist again. Excuse me. And we repackaged it into a sea dye marker for down pilots and air crew with the Air Force. And, you know, I think it translates very well to the Navy because you guys are out in sea a lot, I can imagine. But basically, if you had somebody go overboard, you can then dye that water around them, have it attached to their life vest or however you guys want to attach it, and produces an infrared light for about 8 to 10 hours so that you can easily find that. And we're really just trying to speed up, you know, the chance of rescue over recovery. And I think you've seen it where you, you've tested it already. It's like you can see it from like 10 or, or two miles away, right? Yeah. So our goal was to be able to see it from 500 feet altitude directly overhead. We flew out to uh, Kadena, Japan uh, back in November and did some testing out in the Sea of Japan. And we were able to see it from 2,000 feet altitude from a uh, mile away. That's awesome. And right yeah. now we're working on testing it with some space-based assets. See, that's great. And so for all my Navy people out there, if y'all are involved in the search and rescue world, uh, this is being worked on as we speak. So uh, if you need connections with it, let me know, because that's what I'm talking about. That's in leadership through innovation, like really taking something and applying it to serve our warfighter. Now, yeah, Chris, yeah. your turn. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead, man. No, the, so Chris, let me ask you this. Leading your company, what has been your most difficult challenge of being a leader of your corporation because just see so you know, i don't think we mentioned it before industry standard usa is the name of your company and you've been growing it pretty significantly so what has been the most difficult part as a leader trying to keep people motivated i asked a simpler question of nick earlier keeping people motivated yeah you know um we are we are we are the cheerleader for the company um so we have to go ahead and it i think it's important it all starts from the lowest level, we got to go ahead and inform all of our team members, our vision, and not just for today and not for tomorrow, but 
let them know the one year, two year, five year plan. So six months ago, um, what month was that? I can't even tell you my brain. Shot. <laughs> uh, but we were doing some, uh, we we're doing some planning and some strategic planning saying, all right, we're doing all this landscaping work. There's going to be a time where we're going to get so big, the federal government is not going to let us bid on any more landscaping jobs because you're only allowed to do, I think it's like $8 million a year in landscaping. Mm -hmm. And we're getting damn close to that. So I said, we got to start looking at other avenues. That's when I heard about facility support services. I actually had a, a teaming partner come up to me and say, hey, we need a service to save about to partner up on this opportunity. Are you interested? I looked at the opportunity. I looked at the market. I said, this would be a perfect fit because with facility support services, when you're in that mix code, right, you're allowed to do, I think it's $42 million a year wow. in, that, in, that, in that next code. So that would give us a lot longer runway, right, to still be considered a small business just in a different industry because you want to stay small. You want right. to stay small in the federal government when you're, when you're a private contractor. So to answer your question, to keep everybody informed of uh, the vision in your head, it's, it's, it's great that we all have visions in our head, but if we don't communicate it with the team, they really don't know what tomorrow looks like or a year from now or five years from now. So right now, our whole company is transforming going after these facility support service contracts. They're larger dollar. You know, like I said, San Antonio is 15 million. I just been on another one yesterday in Austin that was an $8 million contract. Wow. So these contracts are a lot larger. We're gonna have to go ahead and bring on a lot more team members onto our team. San Antonio, we're, if we win, we're gonna bring on, I think it's like 15 guys. Austin, wow. we're gonna bring on seven guys. Um, which means we're going to start to bump up on that 50 employee level, which then you got to go ahead and deal with the healthcare issues that go along with that. So we got to be cheerleaders, right? We have to be yep. cheerleaders, but we have to share our vision with our team and let them know where we're going. Also let them know, Hey, when we grow, there's going to be opportunities for you guys to go ahead and move up right within the company. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for you guys to go ahead and move up as we grow. That'll incentivize them. Um, and it's the truth. You know, we like to hire within, instead of going out to the street and trying to bring somebody in, we like to hire within and empower. Um, but the other thing is I want to say hey, in full transparency, and this isn't the question you asked me, but it's lonely on the top. It's lonely when you're the CEO of the company because everybody else from the field, they can turn around and say, Hey, I got an issue to their supervisor. Supervisor will turn around to the project manager. Hey, I got an issue. Project manager will turn around to operations. Hey, I got an issue operations to CEO. When it gets to me, and I turn around, it's just me, right? So it's very lonely on top. So what do I do to stay motivated? And what do I do to go ahead and bounce the ideas off and try to get answers? I go ahead and talk to guys like Nick. I go ahead and talk to guys like Travis. I go ahead and talk to guys like Larry Broughton that are CEOs and say, hey guys, I'm faced with this issue. Any recommendations? What do you think? That's so important. A lot of CEOs don't do that. They just, they keep it bottled in. They try to make the decision and they go with it. I think it's important that we turn and say, hey, fellow CEO and friend, I don't have the answer. Help me out, man. Spitball this with me. What do you think? Very important to do that. I love it. I think that's so important is like, you know, kind of you're talking about that networking of your peers and whatnot earlier. But that is such a huge thing. Like Chris said, it is lonely at the top and you have to have those, you know, core group of people around you that you can turn to. Yeah, that's awesome, guys. Well, listen, guys, I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, we got to roll on to our next amazing speaker. So what I would encourage you guys to do, again, thanks so much for your time, is once we sign off here, people are asking questions. We didn't really have time to do a Q&A live, but people are asking questions on Facebook. So please jump on there, engage with the uh, audience through the messages, answer their questions. And, and guys, if anybody's listening here, uh, these guys are the most approachable people on the planet. So if y'all have an idea or a vision, you want to kick it out, I'm sure they'll reach out to you guys. So Nick, Chris, thank you so much, guys. Appreciate your time. Have a good one, guys. Take care. Bye. Mr. Scott.